You're listening to the Bible teaching ministry of Pastor Ross Graham of Grace Bible Church, Kingswood, New South Wales, Australia. Ross will be using the inerrant Word of God to draw our truths in its original context. To find more messages like this, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org or to join our online community, you can now find us on Facebook by searching for Grace Bible Church Kingswood. May this message today bless you and as always, bring glory to God. Here's Pastor Ross. We bid you greetings uh, tonight in the precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus and we want you to turn in your hymn books to uh, hymn uh, number 473. We'll begin our service in house with uh, the singing of this wonderful old hymn. Wonderful. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. And uh, when we come to know the Lord Jesus as our Saviour, it's a day we never forget, or we should never forget. And for those of you joining us uh, online, there'll be the words of a beautiful song up on your, your screen so that you can sing along. Who's there? 
you take your Bibles and open to the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew momentarily. <clears throat> And I want to remind you afresh and anew that when you turn to the Word of God, it is God's Word, it's inerrant. It's without error from the very first word in Genesis to the very last word in the book of the Revelation and therefore we ought to consider it carefully, study it prayerfully, deepen our hearts, let its oracles dwell and slight not its history but ponder its mysteries for none can ever love it too fondly or well. <coughs> Uh, tonight we want to uh, continue on uh, in our series Back to Our Roots and those of you who are with us this morning know that we spoke on the subject of creation to depravity and we looked at the issue of depravity and we want to continue on a little bit in that area again tonight and we want to develop a few thoughts on that uh, particular topic. Well, I guess I could begin to say this tonight, and I think it's very true for me to say, and I think all of you would agree with me, that everyone loves good news. Uh, most of us, I would have to say, prefer to maximize the positive aspects of life and minim minimize the negative. You know that song, when I was a young man, you have to accentuate the positive and Deliminate or eliminate the negative. You know, it's been a song, and it's uh, was a it's actually a Christian song that came into the came into the secular market many many years ago. But I want to say this to you that the good news found in the Bible or the good news found in the Word of God makes up only part of the message of Christianity. And when we stop to think about it just for a few moments, we really can't truly appreciate the marvelous matchless grace of God and the abundant life that we have in Christ until we truly understand, until we fully understand the dark, dismal backdrop of our humanity and sin. Because the grace of God, you see, overrides that darkness and that sin. We must recognize the dark side of our nature to fully appreciate the grace of God. And the truth of the matter is we prefer as believers in Christ and people in general prefer to keep hidden the dark side from public view. Back in 1886, Robert Louis Stevenson wrote a classic story called Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde that reflected the two sides of human nature. And he and Mark Twain, the American humorist, uh, lived uh, in the same period of time. And so it was maybe Stevenson's tale that prompted Twi uh, Twain, the humorist, to quip, to quip, everyone is a moon and has a dark side which he never shows to anybody. And Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, who was God manifest in the flesh, uh, reflected this truth uh, and, and the truth of this sentiment thousands of years earlier when he sternly opposed the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and the scribes. And he said in the 23rd chapter of the book of Matthew and the 27th and 28th verse, and you should have it open in front of you, Jesus said these words. <coughs> He said, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. Now, church, let's not kid ourselves here tonight that the dark side was a problem only for the Pharisees. Let's not kid ourselves about that here tonight. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to take a few moments to stop and think how you've lived your life over the past several days. 
You have re behaved rather well, I would, would imagine, externally, but probably not as well internally. What thoughts, impulses, and drives and motives prompted your actions that you lived out over the past few days? Were those inner thoughts that you had obvious or did you keep them hidden? Perhaps a few of your underlying motivations have, been, have, uh, have surfaced. But you tro probably tried your best to keep your dark side hidden and show your good side when you're in public. We all do it. We all have the tendency to do that. It's part of our fallen human nature. And the truth of the matter is, there are many people who are street angels and home devils. And that raises the question, what is the deadliest killer of humanity? Well, believe it or not, it's not heart disease or cancer. It's depravity. And the truth is, depravity infests our lives and we all suffer from its consequences. And to make matters worse, we pass our sinfulness and depravity on to each and every subsequent generation. Now in the Hebrew, the word for depravity means to slaughter or beat, to go to ruin, to act corruptly. And Paul, as he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit of God uh, in the New Testament book of Romans, he used the Greek term medokamos in Romans 1.28, which also means depraved. And this term is also translated as not standing the test, rejected, disqualified, unapproved and worthless. And the Bible, let me say to you, describes mankind's depraved condition in a variety of ways, in many, many different ways. It tells us that we're enslaved to sin and that we need to be set free. We're sick with sin and we, need, we are in need of healing. We're impoverished by, impoverished, impoverished by sin and in need of God's riches. And the precious and errant word of God also says that mankind is polluted by sin and he needs to be cleansed. We're blinded by sin and need sight restored. We're lost in the darkness of sin and need Christ's light to illuminate our path and set us free. We're dead in our sin and desperately in need of fresh, revitalized and abundant life. These descriptions graphically illustrate the destructive, degenerative part and nature of depra depravity and shows just how deep the corruption of man is. And all humans, all humans without exception, every single solitary person in this church tonight, including the preacher, all humans suffer corruption. And that corruption, church, affects us physically. It affects us emotionally and mentally and spiritually and relationally. And the corruption of humanity through sin is simply called in theological terms, total depravity. And as I mentioned the last time we were together, that was uh, simply this morning, uh, the teaching or the doctrine of total depravity uh, does not mean mankind is as bad as we could be, but that we are as bad off as we could be. In other words, we have no way on our own of commending ourselves to God, none. Now. Genesis 6.5 contains one of the most telling statements in all of the word of God regarding the depravity of humanity. And you shouldn't have too much trouble finding the, 
Genesis chapter 6 because it happens to be the first book of the Bible. You won't have to flick your pages too much. Just go to the first book of the, the Bible. Find the sixth chapter if you would. And this is what we read in the fifth verse of Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis 6, 5, it says this. <clears throat> The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Every inclination was only evil all the time. And this describes an inescapable universal, universal cesspool within all of humanity. A hidden source of pollution that lies at the root of wrong. And it exists, let me tell you, in the soul of every single solitary person who takes breath. Psalm 51, the passage that... Myrene read for us so well also helps us to come to terms with the doctrine of depravity. You know, King David wrote this psalm following Nathan's con confrontation with him after the king's adultery murder scandal involving Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. Just listen to the words of Psalm 51, 1 through 4 again. Keep in mind he had been involved in adultery and murder. And it says in Psalm 51, 1 and following, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. And David, you see, refers to his sin using words like, and you noticed I emphasize them in the reading, he uses words like transgressions and iniquity, and I have done what is evil in your sight. But you know, also embodied in that uh, psalm is, is his plea for grace, loving kindness and the compassion from God. And perhaps the best known and simplest definition of grace is unmerited favor when we deserve the wrath of God. And you see grace upon grace superabounding grace involves the merciful and loving acts that God does for us that we do not deserve, that we can't earn, and we'll never, ever be able to repay. You see, on our own, we're lost in our sinfulness, helpless to change, and we are polluted to the core. And all we can do, and that's what uh, some of you and all of you, I think, have done. All we can do is to cry out for, to God for his grace, to cry out to God for his mercy. Because God's unmerited favor is our only hope. You see, we're all as bad off as we can be. Unable to do anything on our own merit to please God. And we've all received the penalty of sin. Judgment and death. And only Christ can redeem us from death and renew us to deep relationship and a proper standing before our Heavenly Father so that we may have eternal life with Him. And let me say this to your church here tonight. 
since we're going back to our roots to give you an understanding of why we need a savior. The Bible tells us the truth about its her heroes and heroines in the faith. And unlike Vogue magazine or Dolly magazine or, the, or whatever, some of the, I don't know, they don't have the Woman's Weekly anymore, do they? They do? Or the Woman's, Week, Woman's Weekly? You know, unlike those magazines, the scripture doesn't airbrush its character, its character portraits. It doesn't airbrush them. When it uh, depicts its heroes and heroines, uh, it reveals them as they really are. Warts, and scars, and insecurities, and failures, and all. And whenever we are tempted uh, to elevate uh, a biblical man or woman to a pedestal of worship, one of his or her sinful acts and, or sinful attitudes or confessions brings each one down to size. Each character is completely, totally, and thoroughly human, and every last one except Jesus, every one of them, possesses a nature, a sinful nature, like ours. So let's take a look at five biblical characters and see how their humanity revealed itself in their attitudes and their actions and their choices. First of all is Noah. Remember the passage from Genesis 6-5 we read earlier in the message. Let's read it again, 6-5. You should be there in Genesis chapter 6. And in Genesis 6-5 it says this, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. Now, now, let me just say to you that that passage of scripture describes the earth and its surroundings at the time of Noah. And at the time of Noah, the Lord was grieved that he had, <coughs> had made man. But before judging and destroying humanity by sending a flood, he surveyed the world looking for one person who would qualify as righteous. Just one person. He surveyed the world and sadly, listen, there was only one man. That man was Noah. And Noah found favor in the eyes of God, in the sight of God. And the scripture says this about Noah, and it's in Genesis 6, 9. It says this, look, you can follow it along. It says, this is the account of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. And he walked with God. Noah was righteous. He was blameless. He walked with God. I'm here to tell you that's quite a resume. And this godly man was surrounded by gross wickedness like a flower growing out of a cesspool. And God appointed him to build an ark in order to save his family from drowning in the flood. And that's exactly what good old Noah did. And he worked on it consistently for 120 years, enduring constant ridicule from those around him. Huh, what are you building that big boat for? Oh, well, there's going to be a flood. Well, you know, they said to him, well, huh, there's never been rain. But while he worked, he preached. And while he preached, he warned people about the flood. And when he finally finished the ark, he ushered his family inside, and then the flood began. And only Noah and his family were saved from the destruction. In Genesis 9, 
brings us to the end of the flood. <clears throat> when Noah and his family disembarked from the ark to settle on a new earth. Well, let me paint the picture for you. Here stands a man who has been walking with God all of these years. Blameless, righteous, and he walked with God. What a model of courage and determination. But as soon as we're about to see Noah as a flawless, godly man, a blameless man, we find out that he had a dark side. And in verses uh, 20 and 22 of chapter 9 of Genesis, we read this. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to plant a vineyard. And when he drank some of its wine, he became drunk and lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father's nakedness and told his two brothers outside. The phrase lay uncovered in the Hebrew indicates that Noah found himself in an inappropriate sexual position. And on top of that, he was drunk. Question. How could a righteous man get drunk in his tent and blatantly uncover himself? Answer. Noah had a depraved nature that led him to sin against God. And that brings us to Moses. Secondly, now we consider Moses, all of us I should imagine would consider Moses to be one of the greatest saints in all of scripture. God used uh, him mightily to lead the Hebrew people out of slavery in Egypt and God chose him to receive the law uh, to bring down the tablets from Mount Sinai and to unveil it to the Hebrews and to lead the Israelites through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. That was Moses. But Moses had a dark side too. Great man of God, but he had a dark side. You see, when he was about 40 years old, He angrily murdered an Egyptian and hit him in the sand in an attempt to enact his own plan of deliverance for the Hebrews. And then 40 years later, he resisted God's call to be the sole spokesman to Pharaoh and to the Hebrews. And moreover, during an outbreak of complaints among the Hebrews, Moses chose to disregard God's way of handling the problem and instead responded in a fit of rage. You know the story. It's in Numbers chapter 20. God said, speak to the rock and water will flow from the rock. And Moses went, wham, wham. Must we bring water from this rock in a fit of, a, a fit of rage? And due to Moses' outburst of anger, God refused him entry into the promised land. Clearly, Moses was deprived. And then thirdly, there's a fellow by the name of David. Many years after the Hebrews entered the land of promise, the promised land, God chose a young shepherd named David to reign as king over his people. 
And the Word of God says in 1 Samuel 13, 14, and I think again from memory in the book of Acts somewhere, that the, and the Bible calls David a man after God's own heart. This is David, shepherd boy, killed a giant, great man of God, a man after God's own heart. In fact, for the first time in Israel's history, let me tell you, the nation rose to economic, military and spiritual prominence under the rule of this shepherd king, David. But as great as David was, he still had a sinful nature. One fateful evening he took a walk on his palace roof and he saw a beautiful woman bathing. And with a body and heart brimming with lust, he sent for her. And the scripture says in 2 Samuel 11, he slept with her. And Bathsheba conceived that night. Because David was desperate to cover his tracks, he engineered the death of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. Bathsheba became David's wife. Adultery, deceit, murder. All sinful acts com committed by a believer. This one was a man after God's own heart. Why? Well, David was depraved, pure and simple. And fourthly, there's Peter. Turning to the New Testament, we encounter a hard-working fisherman named Peter who gave up his trade to follow Christ. And in one of his greatest moments, he identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son, of the living God. But in Jesus' most difficult hour, Peter deserted him and even denied him. Another faithful follower fell prey to the corruption within. And fifthly, Paul. The Apostle Paul ranks as perhaps the best known evangelist, church planter, writer and theologian of the early church. Yet he openly admitted his struggle with sin. Let me show you that. <clears throat> Go in your Bibles to Romans chapter 7. Romans in the seventh, verse, seventh chapter, and then find the 15th verse. Romans 7, verse 15. And here we read these words. Romans 7, 15 and following. <clears throat> He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For what I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Like Paul, we may sincerely desire to please God. But even our best wishes and intentions are often thwarted by the depravity that lurks within our hearts and minds. Now, all these little vignettes that I've given you tonight have painted a bleak picture of humanity. 
Now let me say to you, all is not lost. All is not lost. And I simply say that because one man, the God-man, broke the horrible, destructive cycle of depravity, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he took on a perfect nature and lived his life in complete obedience to God the Father. Then he who never committed a single solitary sin paid the penalty for our sin. He paid sin's debt by dying on the cross in our place, our substitute. And by trusting him as our savior, we receive forgiveness. Now listen to me carefully. And the power, the power, the power, the power, the power to overcome sin. And I want to tell you that's fantastic news. Through his all-sufficient work in his death and resurrection, those who trust in Jesus Christ have a right standing before God Almighty. And Christ has, according to Romans 6.6, 6, uh, done away with or literally, literally made or rendered powerless the sinful nature. Now, this doesn't mean the sinful nature no longer exists. We all know that it does. But let me tell you what, what, what uh, the work of the cross has done. The sinful nature no longer has the power to make us sin. You have the power through the indwelling spirit of God not to sin. You will because you have a sinful nature, but you have the power to say no. And the fact that Christians now find their identity in Christ alone does not mean at all that the old sin nature no longer exerts its influence on us because we know that it does. But it only means this, that we don't have to respond to it because we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome the temptation of sin. Now when we boil down all that we've learned, we are faced with two options. We can choose to live either as victims of our depravity or as victors through Jesus Christ's power. Let me give that to you again. We can choose to live either as victims of our depravity or as victors through Jesus Christ's power. We don't have to give in. We don't have to give in to our sinful inclinations. But we cannot fight successfully on our own. Only in Christ, only in him, can we live victoriously. Here's the question. Which option? Which option? will you choose? Let's bow. Father, we want to thank you tonight for the all-sufficient work of the cross. We want to thank you, Lord, here tonight that Jesus' work has literally rendered powerless our sinful nature. And whilst we will be influenced by it, it really no longer has the power to make us sin. We really don't have to respond to the temptations that come because we have the power of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome that temptation of sin. 
So tonight, Father, help us to choose not to live as victims of our depravity, but to live as victors through the power of Jesus Christ. And because of that, may you get all the praise, all of the honour and all of the glory. For we ask it in his strong and precious name. Amen. Amen. I want you to enjoy the closing song, which I think maybe take my hand, precious Lord. And for those of you at home, there'll be a beautiful song up on your screen to sing along to. He heals my broken heart with wounded hands He calms my troubled mind He understands My weaknesses and longings deep inside Oh how I really wish I could describe this kind of love, this kind of friend. When I try to tell you how it feels, where do I begin? It's so awesome and amazing. It's hard to comprehend This kind of love This kind of friend Each time I need someone Who really cares I reach for him to find that he's been there to walk with me down every lonely road. How beautiful and wonderful to know this kind of love. This kind of friend When I try to tell you how it feels Where do I begin? It's so awesome and amazing It's hard to comprehend This kind of love this kind of friend It's so awesome and amazing it's hard to comprehend This kind of love This kind of friend This kind of love This kind of Father, we sense your spirit in this place tonight. 
We know it's here really because it dwells within each one of us. But we sense perhaps it's hovered on the deep waters in someone's life in this place tonight. I pray, Father, that you would continue to touch them, touch all who are in the hearing of my voice. And may you get the praise and the honour and the glory as that person comes to the foot of the cross. Dismiss us with your blessing, we pray, in the precious and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you for tuning in to Pastor Ross Graham. And for more information about his ministry, visit www.gracebiblechurchkingswood.org. Until next time, God bless.